This episode of To The Journey is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 150,000 titles for your desktop or mobile device. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter. Visit enterpriseinspace.org for more details. Hi, this is Robert Duncan McNeil, also known as Tom Paris from Star Trek Voyager. You're listening to Trek FM. I think it's safe to say that no one on this crew has been more obsessed with getting home than I have. But when I think about everything we've been through together. Maybe it's not the destination that matters. Maybe it's the journey. If that journey takes a little longer, so we can do something we all believe in, I can't think of any place I'd rather be, or any people I'd rather be with. To the journey. You're here. To the journey. 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 Hi everyone at home and welcome. This is To The Journey. I'm your co-host Kay Shaw and with me as always are Zachary Fruling and Suzanne Williamson. So tonight we're going to carry on with a theme that we've done a few times now and we might we might carry on doing a bit more in the future. Another one of our pairing episodes. Tonight we're going to talk about Captain Janeway and Seven of Nine. Interesting relationship. What do you guys think about it? I think I kind of have a love-hate relationship with Captain Janeway and Seven of Nine. I love the character moments that they have together. I think some of Voyager's best moments are with these two characters. On the other hand, in thinking about how many moments there actually were, it actually started to get a bit repetitive for me. You know, I can only listen to Captain Janeway give Seven advice on humanity or compassion or fill in the blank so many times before it gets a little repetitive. And I, I honestly don't like what the the overdose of Captain Janeway and Seven of Nine did to the character development of other characters in the later seasons of Voyager. Yeah, I think I agree with that up to a point, but that something interesting came out of, of, of the exercise of doing this, which I think I'll talk about a little bit later on. So I know we don't have to make a choice between loving the Janeway 7 interaction and hating the Janeway 7 interaction, but Suzanne, where do you stand overall on Janeway 7? I can love it and I can hate it. I remember when Seven first joined the crew as I was watching it back way back in the 90s as a little tyke. I didn't like Seven. Did not like her at all. I thought she was arrogant, a fuss budget, and it just, she rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah, she certainly comes across very abrasive to start with. And then the whole Janeway maternal side emerges and I'm like, is this really what I want to see from the captain? No, not really. Yeah, Janeway was always a bit maternal with the crew, but she really gets maternal with Seven. Yeah, she was really hands-on. Yeah, I think we should talk a bit more about this later. Yes. After we've talked about some of, some of the specific moments. But yeah, I think that the relationship that develops between the two of them is is quite an interesting thing to think about how that came about and why that came about and what, what it actually means um, about the dynamic of the crew in general and what it means about the two characters. But we'll get into that a bit later. So who wants to start? I think you should start, Kay. I know okay. for a fact that your list is way longer than ours. Kay should start. Go Kay, go Kay. <laughs> okay, I'm starting. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's on your list, but I know it's longer than my list. Okay, well, if I'm starting, I'm going to go with the one that I figured that I would never actually get to say because everybody else would say it first. Because I think there is one particular moment that if you say Janeway 7... It's the very first thing that comes into my head, and I'm sure it's the very first thing that comes into a lot of other people's heads as well, um, which is a moment from the Voyager conspiracy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think we can all check that off the list right now. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) I knew it was going to be on everybody's list, but I couldn't not say it. So quickly to recap for anybody that doesn't remember it, we, we get the whole thing with Seven having this problem with her implants or whatever uh, that means that she gets this conspiracy theory about the fact that Voyage has been sent out there to get her so that she can be dissected for Borg information or whatever. <laughs> so that that happens and, and she's sort of gradually getting more and more admired in this conspiracy theory and everybody's trying to pull her out of it. 
um, and she she ends up on the Delta Flyer with with Captain Janeway. She's got Janeway behind a force field, and and she's sort of like, you you all conspired against me. You're all trying to you know you're trying to get me back to the Alpha Quadrant so I can be experimented on. And she she comes up with all these in inverted commas facts, alternative facts maybe if you like. And Janeway sort of does this this really beautiful job of of talking at her out of it by using the way that Seven said, oh on this date this happened, on this date this happened, and, and Janeway's sort of going, oh well, on this star date is when we rescued you, and then this is the first time this happened, this is the first time that happened, and. I picked this out particularly just because I think out of all of the moments that there are of Janeway 7, and there are a lot, it is the most emotional. There's just something really emotive about this scene, and I still get choked up every time I watch it. I don't know how many times I've seen it, but I still get a lump in the back of my throat every time I watch it. Oh, I I love this scene. But they missed a perfect opportunity to take it one step further and have a hug. I mean, it's season six. They've gotten pretty close to each other and gotten to know each other pretty well. Why not take it that yeah. one step further and just have Captain Janeway give her a hug? So you want some Janeway 7 trust falls? I, was, I, I wanted a little something there. I think that would have that that would have totally worked in this scene. I think in most of the other scenes that would have been overkill. Yeah. But in this scene... It would have worked perfectly. It hits you right in the feels. Like, okay, Captain, you stand there and fall over and I'll catch you. Okay, it's my turn. Do I get to fall over now? (laughs) Okay, we're talking about an emotional moment here, not a team building exercise. (laughs) I think what I love about this moment is that it's a microcosm of the entire Janeway 7 relationship. You get a nice overview moment by moment of everything. Not a macrocosm. There are no Janeway biceps involved. Sadly, it's a microcosm (gasps) of, of their entire relationship. Yes, a last macrocosm is pre seven of nine, so we can't talk about that one tonight. <laughs> Boo! I want my compression phaser yeah. rifle time. <laughs> my my favorite bit actually about this scene because it is actually quite a long scene. It's it's about four or five minutes, and my favorite bit of it is is at the end of where Janeway's sort of been quoting these these dates. She says, "Oh, on star date, whatever." For the first time, Seven tells the captain, thank you. And then and then Seven corrects her. She, mm-hmm. she sort of says, oh, no, actually, it was it was this star date, you know, the uh, the day after or something. And she says what time it was and where it happened. And everything. <laughs> and there's just this there's just this nice little moment where you just see that after everything that's gone on in that episode, you just see that actually she's got through to her. She's just yeah. got she's broken through that. And what she said has worked. And it's just there's something about. Kate Mulgrew's delivery in this scene that really nails it for me. That's so seven of nine, though. Can't you just picture like little tiny Annika Hansen when she was a little kid walking <laughs> around correcting everyone? Kind of like Naomi Wildman. <laughs> yes, exactly. But correcting everyone. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because we don't really know what she was like before she was assimilated. She might have been a really different kid. Oh, who knows? Well, we see the one shot of her in the shuttlecraft with her yeah, parents a little bit. when she's kind of shy and quiet, but we don't really get enough information to know there. But there, yeah, there's just something really really nice about this scene well, i think it shows how much captain janeway cares for seven of nine i think you can yeah. the the emotion is kind of dripping from her voice as she says you know she's listing the star dates and describing you can feel the the care and concern she's developed for seven even yeah. though seven really annoys her sometimes <laughs> absolutely yeah like when they're playing Velocity. Is that your first pick? Zachary? That That is actually my first pick. My first pick is from the episode Hope and Fear, where Captain Janeway and Seven of Nine are playing Velocity together. And if you remember, Captain Janeway is, is they're playing 10 matches. And I think Captain Janeway's won six and Seven of Nine has won four matches. And Seven of Nine cannot believe that Captain Janeway is getting the best of her in Velocity. Absolutely. We want to put an emphasis as well on the fact that from what you've just said, I've interpreted that you have picked the Velocity scene from Hope and Fear from the beginning of the episode the, the emphasis on this will become important later <laughs> <laughs> i love when captain janeway tells seven seven be a sport <laughs> the yeah. game's over yeah it's a nice one I, I love seeing them playing velocity together actually i really do it's nice i wish we saw more of the crew sort of interacting in that type of way in a leisure capacity i know we see bits and bobs of those type of things but i don't feel like we see enough of them enjoying leisure time together and i just it's nice that we see that 
first of all from Janeway obviously teaching her but also the fact that she's not <laughs> afraid to give her a good thrashing which I absolutely adore well <laughs> we don't see them doing that much physical stuff on Voyager you know? no. we get a lot yeah. of like intellectual Calto games that kind of thing right yeah or hanging yeah. out in the resort program <laughs> well you know that can get a bit energetic at times but and you know Tuvok can go blood sport with Calto sometimes but well yeah yeah <laughs> Tuvok unhinged will go blood sport with Kalto. Tuvok unhinged, yeah, that gets a bit uh, gets a bit dangerous on the Kalto front. But yeah, I just I really like the fact that Janeway actually beats her. I find it really fantastic that the emphasis here in this scene is the fact that just because she's Borg and she's like got really good reactions and she's got really good processing, that it doesn't automatically mean that she can win because she she doesn't sort of understand the nuances of the game. And all the sort of subtleties, which I think is just really... I, I just like that. I like the way it's put together. I think Captain Janeway should have just said, look, hey, I've been doing this longer than you, and I'm better at it. <laughs> so so you don't see a bunch of countries, uh, like, taking Borg and trying to get them on their Olympic teams, is what you're saying. Because they're not going to do that well. Is that like the refugee well, Olympic team? Well, I think team? it depends on the sport, really. <laughs> I, I don't know. What sports do we think the Borg would be incredibly good at? How about curling? I think they'd be good at curling. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Moving the broom really fast. Would they not have to be Scottish Borg, though? No, oh, I think they'd be Canadian Borg. Wasn't it the Scots that invented curling? I, I don't know. The Canadians run away with it all the time. It's not a sport that I'm I'm particularly fay with, I must say. <laughs> For some reason, whenever it comes on, I have to watch it. I don't know why. It's quite, quite bonkers. It's a strange sickness. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I guess I can picture the Borg being good at gymnastics, like Nadia back in the day, getting a perfect ten. Oh, like I can picture striving for seven, success. I can picture Annika Hansen being like a like a like Nadia doing gymnastics. Yeah, yeah. Whatever her last name was, Nadia. Whatever. Come in each. That one. Maybe some sort of martial art, because obviously we get the whole Sun Katsy thing. Seven uh-huh. does pretty well there, so. Maybe the Borg would be good at martial arts. I don't know. They're they're certainly good at the technical aspects of the game, but whether they're good at the sort of strategy is another matter. I feel like the Borg the Borg would be good at team sports, obviously, right? You don't have to worry about team communication. Yeah. So not good chess players. No, they do better as groups, right? Mm. Yeah. If they're if they're Borg that are still part of the collective. Are, are there are there any team sports in the Olympics that require nine players, so seven can be seven of nine? I'm not I don't know. Oh, I don't know, probably hockey or one of those type how of things. How many do you need in basketball? I don't know how many you need. <laughs> No idea. We're not really so much into basketball over here. You guys ought to know that. <laughs> well, how many do you need for cricket? Cricket? Mm-hmm. You need 11 for cricket, but cricket's not an Olympic sport anyway. It's not? No. Why not? Because the only people who play it are us and the people we taught it to. I was going to say the Indians play it a lot. They do, but most countries don't play it. That's nuts. Seven of nine would be good at Olympic baseball because there are, are nine people frugling? on a baseball team. <laughs> he is frugling. Yeah, I'm frugling. <laughs> You're frugling, aren't you? <laughs> No, think about it. Se- seven of nine would fill the seven hole in a baseball team, a baseball lineup. Well, what position would you put her in? That's a good question. I don't know any of the positions. Don't ask me. I would say shortstop. I would say third base because she was at third base. She could do a nice straight shot over to first every time. I could see her stopping a runner between second and third shortstop. Bam. Knocking him down. <laughs> this means nothing to me. I could start talking about cricket fielding positions and then I'd confuse you both. <laughs> Well, wicketkeeper, that makes sense. But apart from that, it, they're all quite quite mad. Deep, backward, square leg. That's a position? Yeah. Deep, backwards, square leg. <laughs> sounds like it's painful. Yeah. <laughs> Are we on gymnastics you yourself again? doing that. No, no, we're on cricket. <laughs> velocity. Velocity. I have to say, I think velocity looks like a lot of fun, and I'd love to have a go at it if it was actually a thing. I'm sure you could get a game of laser tag over there in the UK, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, we have laser tag, but it's not it's not quite the same as that. So anyways, that that was my first pick. When okay. Captain Janeway and Seven play Velocity, I like that Captain Janeway says, Seven, you lost, get over it. I have to go with um, Latent Image, where Seven's counsel actually changes Janeway's mind about how the doctor's being treated. She compares what he's going through, his situation, to her own. So why should he not have to deal with the consequences of his actions in, instead of, you know, doing what they did and erasing his memory, which was pretty messed up. Yeah, I find this a really fascinating scene, actually, because 
I think it's the only time we actually see Captain Janeway go to Seven for advice of this nature. Yeah, we see her go mm-hmm. to her for advice on like scientific and astrometric things, but actual sort of real high level stuff. This is the only time that we actually see her go to Seven for advice. And I think it's a real marker point in Seven's progress that Janeway feels like she's got to the point where she can have that conversation with her. And it's also the first time we see the captain reverse her decision as a result of Seven's arguments. So, I mean, that that says something about their relationship, that she's actually willing to seek out and take her counsel. Yeah, most of the time we see Captain Janeway kind of telling Seven of Nine why Seven's wrong, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's it's Seven who has something to learn. And this time Captain Janeway is the one who's kind of humbled herself up a little bit and asking Seven for advice and, and actually listening. It re- yeah, it's a real watershed moment for me. It feels a lot like when you have kids that get to sort of 18 and older and they start to become adults and the parents actually start to realise that the kids have their own ideas about stuff. They're starting to teach the parents stuff for the first time because they've got a different viewpoint on the world because they're from a different generation and they see things in a different way and they're in different circles. And and it feels like it's that it's that point once the child's got to the age where actually they can have some input that will help the parent with something i think that's yeah it's a great scene it's still quite surprising i think when you when you see her approach the alcove i've seen it quite a few times but i mean when you see her approach there and she she sort of said oh i'm having trouble with the nature of individuality or however she puts Mm it it's just really it's not what you're expecting we haven't seen it and it just it still makes me go oh Okay. That and also Seven being asked if she could change what happened or erase what happened, would she? And she wouldn't. And that's interesting to f- to find out now that even though as many times as she said, I want to go back to the collective, blah, blah, blah. Now she realizes, no, that's not what I want. That's not who I am. Yeah. So Suzanne, what you were saying there is, is actually related to my next pick. My next pick is from the episode Think Tank, in which Seven of Nine is trying to decide whether to join the Think Tank or stay on, on Voyager. And again, this is, this is part of Seven of Nine's character growth. Captain Janeway helps Seven see that, you know, she doesn't really want to be part of a collective again, right? She can go join this think tank and essentially have it. It's a non-board collective, but it's a type of collective. And, you know, she's got a family on Voyager and she doesn't need to be part of this, you know, wacky think tank. She, you know, she wants to stay on Voyager at the end of the day. And I think Captain, Captain Janeway helps her see that. Well, that and who would want to join George Costanza's think tank? <laughs> He has the weirdest voice in this episode. Yeah. I mean, he's always a little weird, but he's so he's such a weird, creepy character really in this, in this episode. It is creepy. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting what you say there about all Voyager has become Seven's collective. Because another pick that I had was from Dark Frontier, which is the episodes where we're sort of delving a lot more into into Seven's past, and we've got some more exciting Borg stuff going on. Um, and Seven's wanting to go on, on this mission and Janeway doesn't want to let her go because she thinks that, that she's at risk of the Borg being able to control her. And, and Seven's sort of, no, I need to go on this mission because I care about what happens to these people because, you know, Voyage is my collective now. And and she, and we actually see her say please, which I think is the first time we hear that as well. <laughs> but she also says Voyager is my collective in Drone at the very end. Mm. That's true, actually. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that one. I love that episode. I remember her saying that, but I remember nothing else about that particular scene, weirdly. Yeah, that was, the in general, the trouble I had with coming up with this list. I had a hard time remembering these specific moments because they, they all kind of fall Blur into the same categories. One. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. Captain yeah. Janeway teaches Seven of Nine something. Seven of Nine's being rebellious. Um, you know, there's there, there aren't too many different varieties of these seven Captain Janeway moments. There aren't, but I think there are certain moments of scenes that really stand out. Like the Voyager Conspiracy one that really stood out. Another one that really stands out for me was from Imperfection, which is where we see Seven. She's looking at the Grand Canyon and, and Janeway comes in and she she says, oh, I prefer farming country. And she switches to this this picture of Janeway's hometown in Indiana. Mm-hmm. That's a really nice scene. It's only a little scene, but it's very memorable. And I put it on my favorite list because I just, I, re- I really like the fact that we, we get this. So Janeway says, oh, I'll take you there when we get to Earth. 
And obviously at this point, Seven is... It, it's the episode where Seven's got her cortical nodes failing and the, the, eventually they get Echeb to donate his and stuff. Echeb saves the day! Echeb does save the day! Woohoo! Yeah, so Seven's having a bit of a... Almost, almost a bit of an existential thing where she's like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to be here, you know, I'm not going to survive. And she's really facing her the idea of her own mortality for the first time. And she starts saying about the people who've already died and, and how she doesn't understand how Janeway won't accept her death. Be, and, Jane, and, and Seven interprets this as being because she feels like she hasn't finished her work in, in, in getting Seven to be what she wants to be or modelling her into this ideal in, in her own image or whatever. And, and that's how Seven sees it. And, and Janeway's like, no, it's because I care about you. You know what I would love to see? I'd, I would love to see Seven of Nine do a confessional, kind of like the doctor does when his program's about to be decompiled. <laughs> I wonder what Seven of Nine would have to confess to the rest of the crew, given her imminent death. <laughs> Yeah, that would have been really funny, actually. We don't really get very many funny Jane Wayne Seven moments. They're all a lot more, a lot more serious. There are three different flavors of Jane Wayne Seven moments. Really, there's the really emotional, sweet moments. There's the oh, here is the here is the lesson. Here is the lesson from what you are saying moments. And then there's the we're just going to scream at each other moments because you've just completely gone against whatever I said, et cetera. So wh- why do you think we didn't get more funny Janeway seven moments? Because they, they have their funny scenes with other characters. That's just not the nature of their relationship. And I actually think in a way, this scene in, in Imperfection, this scene kind of says why. Because seven thinks that she's a disappointment to Janeway. And and you can see how she's come to that conclusion from everything that's gone before because Janeway's always like, oh no, you're wrong. And she, either she says you're wrong nicely or she says you're wrong not nicely, but either way, that's normally what she's saying. You're saying she's kind of like Worf on Star Trek The Next Generation. Everyone's always telling Worf no. Worf yeah. no. <laughs> no. Can't, you can't, can't raise shields. You can't fire phasers. Yeah, and then every so often we get a, oh, you've come so far moment. But mostly <laughs> it's just no. You're wrong. <laughs> and we hardly ever see Seven sitting down, just like Worf. I was noticing that. I, like, that is true. Every single scene, Seven is standing up mm-hmm. in almost all of Voyager. That's a great observation. The one time that I could think of is when she was on that date. <laughs> and the date. And she's sitting down having trying to eat the lobster. That's the only moment that came to mind that we actually see her. It's a conscious thing. I think that was a conscious characterization thing that they did because there's a few times when Seven actually says she's invited to sit down and she says, oh, no, I prefer to stand. And I think there's actually one point where she says that and Jamie says, oh, I forgot. I keep forgetting that she prefers to stand, I guess, because the Borg don't sit down. I was going to say, yeah, they don't really have chairs on their cubes. So she's just used to standing all the time. Do you think they'd at least have some cube-shaped stools to sit down? <laughs> cube-shaped stools. <laughs> Cubules. Little little Borg sitting pods. Cubicles. Cubicles. They have cubicles. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have cubicles. They have alcoves. What are you talking about? I was going to say that doesn't even work because it's already a word. But there was me trying to make up a word, and I came up with a word that already existed. <laughs> Whoops. It could have been used for an alcove before they came up with alcove. I mean, we we must see. I can't think of any off the top of my head. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I can't think of one. But we must see Seven like at the um, conference table in the briefing room or something, right? Yeah. Probably. At some point. We must. Because in Tinker Ten of Doctor Spy in the Doctor's head, she's sitting down when she's right, winking okay. at him across the table. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. There. Okay. That's two moments we see Seven Well, that's down before she's room. naked yeah. and on the chaise. Yes. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's required for the art. Well, that's that's number three. There you go. <laughs> She's not going to stand naked in her alcove and let him paint her. That's not exactly the sort of ambiance he was going for. <laughs> that is a much funnier version of that scene. I think you just rewrote that scene, Kay. <laughs> Actually, you, you know what Seven of Nine reminds me of? The fact that she doesn't sit down very much. It reminds me of Star Trek The Motion Picture. When Captain Kirk is telling Spock, will you please sit down? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I I think it's nice that they keep that little bit of characterization in there for her. I think I I, I like stuff like that. You know, little things that don't really add anything to a story, but actually it just gives you that that extra little bit of character. And it's it's only when you do an exercise like this where you're looking at a lot of those moments when you actually realize 
how often she is standing up. So now that I'm mm. podcasting standing up at my stand-up desk, am I more Seven of Nine-like than I was a week ago? Yes. We shall call you Two of Three. Okay. I see something starting to sprout on your cheek right now. <laughs> I'll run to the restroom and take care of that. Real yeah. Quick. <laughs> yeah. You keep your nano probes to yourself. <laughs> so the last one that I had on my my actual list is from the episode Prey, and that's the episode where really Captain Janeway gives Seven of Nine a lesson in compassion. You know, she's trying; they're trying to analyze the strategy, how to deal with this member of species eight four seven two, and Seven of Nine is really kind of stuck in you know, pros and cons and costs and benefits and tactics and strategies. And she needs a lesson from Captain Janeway on compassion and ethics. And, you know, it's not just a matter of boiling everything down to to tactics like she's used to thinking about in terms of the Borg. She needs a lesson on how to uh, approach another being, even a being on the other side of the fence that, you know, with, with some compassion, with some humanity. Yeah, she's still very much in Borg mode at this point. And, and I wonder mm-hmm. if well, I think this is probably one of the first really big lessons that we actually see Janeway giving to Seven, because this is fairly early on. I mean, we're only halfway into seri- Series 4 at this point. I love that Seven of Nine tells Captain Janeway, a lesson in humanity won't do me any good if I'm dead. Which is true. <laughs> she is quite right. <laughs> it's very true. very true. She talks back to the captain. It, it is true, but it, it does demonstrate a case of fundamentally missing the point. <laughs> See, so can't, can't you pick, again, let's just boil this down to like little Annika Hansen. Can't you picture little Annika Hansen having to do her math homework? She's like, algebra won't do me any good if I'm dead. <laughs> again, very true. <laughs> I was going to say most of the time algebra won't do you any good if you're not dead. <laughs> <laughs> and this is from somebody with a maths degree. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, this is the 24th century. Little Annika Hansen would say, calculus won't do me any good if I'm dead. Yeah, that's true. It's going to be calculus. Yeah, Prey is a really interesting episode, actually, all around. There's a lot of different Janeway Seven scenes in here. One, one that I, I didn't actually make my list, but it was, it was, it was on my short list. Was the was actually the the scene at the end of Prey, which which is quite a confrontational scene between the two of them. Which is after the point where where Seven's gone against Janeway's orders and gone, nope, I'm going to kill these this guy, you know. And she sort of goes in there, and I, I really like the bit we get from Seven. Which is a very interesting point where she goes, oh, you made me into an individual. You know, you encouraged me to cultivate this. And now that I'm asserting it, you're, you're, you're telling me that I need to stop. And I don't really understand. Quite rightly, she, she fails to understand the fact that, you know, she's done that. And Janeway sort of says, oh, individuality has limits. And there's a structure that you have to, you have to follow on a starship and all this type of thing. But then Seven says, you're punishing me because I don't think like you. You say you respect my individuality, but actually you're scared of it. Mm-hmm. And Janeway just says, as you were, and she walks out. And we never really get to see what Janeway actually thinks about that. And I actually think saying what Seven's a bit close to the nerve there, to be honest. Yeah. The, the difference Fair in enough. perspective that they have is interesting. C- Captain Janeway has this perspective of balance, right? You balance, mm-hmm. you, you know, the needs of the group with your role as an individual. And Seven of Nine just sees contradiction. She doesn't see that the two are consistent. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, because everything's still very black and white for her, especially at this stage. Mm -hmm. You either have your individuality or you don't, and she doesn't understand the idea that, well, people still have to comply with rules. So, Suzanne, are you saying that with Seven and Captain Janeway, you want a few more shades of grey, like 50? Maybe 51, like haagen That would be better. (laughs) Let's not go anywhere near that other thing. (laughs) Hey, I'm open to any kind of relationship they wanted to throw at me. Unfortunately, <laughs> they didn't throw that many relationships at me. Sadly not. There you go. But that's what fanfic is for. I haven't read any Janeway 7 fanfiction. None at all? Out of, wait, wait, wait. After all the, out of all the fanfiction you've read, you've never read Janeway 7. And I'm not yeah. a fanfic reader There's myself. There's some really, really good ones. But if I were going to read Voyager fanfic, I'd probably start with some 7 and Janeway. No, I haven't. I just haven't. I haven't branched out that far. I haven't finished all the Janeway Chicote stuff yet. No, oh, you never will, because there's <laughs> so, always more. There's no finishing for Janeway Chicote. <laughs> they, they're writing them faster than I can read them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a bad thing. I'll take as many of those as I can get. Well, there's, in Hunters, once they start getting letters from home, Janeway reminds Seven, hey, you might still have family on Earth. You need to think about that possibility. 
Well, I love that it never really occurred to Seven that she might have living relatives and they may want to contact her. She's not used to thinking in terms of family like yeah. that. No, I know that's only, it's it's quite a short moment that really, because it's quite, it's a longer scene, but it's just that little bit at the end. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, I just, we just get this really nice reaction from Seven where she just kind of goes, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. I just that that's really nice because again it's still fairly early in the seven progression and it's just oh, yeah. it's, it's new for us to see her having those sort of moments where she goes oh actually maybe that is something that I'm interested in maybe that is something that has an emotional resonance for me out of all the things seven remembers I mean she's got an encyclopedic memory she can't remember eating strawberries <laughs> <laughs> So we've got our three categories of Janeway seven moments, right? We've got the seven learns a lesson. We've got the sweet and tender moments and we've got the antagonistic variety, right? Yeah. What are we missing? Are there other kinds of moments besides those three? No, 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 that's it. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> those Podcast are the only over, three flavors. <laughs> they are. They really are actually. Cause I scanned down my long list and that they really all fit into one of those. So it's like, Neapolitan ice cream. We have strawberry to bring it back to strawberries. We've got vanilla, vanilla. We've got chocolate. Well, okay. I have a challenge for you then, Kay, actually. Since since you're, I know for a fact that your list is a lot longer than ours because you had more time to do research this time around than, than I did. Well, you have covered some of the ones I had on it, but yeah. No, let's, let's play, let's play a little game. Let's go through those three categories. And then your challenge is to rattle off a new moment from each of those categories as you go through your list. Okay. I just thought of this game right now. So the first category is seven learns a lesson. Give us another one of those. Okay, which one are we going to pick? Oh, there's a nice one from Random Thoughts, which is which is where Seven comes in and she she's telling Janeway off because she's doing too much exploring. She's like, well, this is really inefficient. <laughs> oh, when she just walks right into the ready room, no yeah. announcing herself, just bam, right in. Yeah, yeah. I, I must speak with you or something, she says, I think. Captains don't react well to yeah. that usually. She starts telling her off and then she's like... No. Well, that would be a very boring trip home. So that was, that was quite a funny moment. And it's like, you know, we just do it because we want to. We just like exploring, you know. And then my favourite bit of this whole scene is, is, is when Jamie goes, it's how we get knowledge. And Seven says, then we are in disagreement. And Jamie says the most amazing line, good. I dread the day when everyone on the ship agrees with me. <laughs> That's beautiful. I love that line. Well, it, it's a little known fact that this scene actually led to the popular 25th century expression as the Borg flies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, that was Seven Learns a Lesson. Now give us a sweet, tender Seven Janeway moment. Earlier on when you mentioned the velocity moment, Zachary, you'll remember that I did make a very uh, clear distinction that you were talking about the one at the beginning of the episode, because now I'm going to talk about the one at the end of the episode, which is actually quite different in tone. At the end of the episode, Seven sort of, she she's talking about something that she's going to go and do instead of playing velocity, and she says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some stuff with slipstream velocities or something. Janeway says, I thought it was impossible and i like the fact that seven says impossible is a word humans use far too often <laughs> <laughs> which i think is gorgeous and then she's we, we we get a sense here of seven sort of going i was really scared of getting to earth and actually now i've realized that going back to the borg isn't what i want to do so then we get this nice bit where janeway says sometimes you have to look back to look forwards mm -hmm. that that's definitely a seven and janeway feel good moment yeah yeah and and Janeway says, oh, you're starting to embrace your humanity. So, to which Seven replies, no, but that, but as I said, nothing's impossible. <laughs> which, is, which is nice. Okay, what I was thinking of doesn't fall into that category. Does it fall into Seven Janeway antagonism? No, it goes back to the Seven learning something, but not really a lesson. Well, hit us with it. Maybe it's a new category. Okay, it's Seven being encouraged to learn something. And it's from 1159 when uh, Janeway encourages Seven to learn more about her own ancestors after telling her stories of Shannon O'Donnell. And then yeah. also telling her not to discount the impact of the stories that of Shannon O'Donnell that they had on Janeway's life, even though, you know, they didn't turn out to be all that true. They still made an impact. So we have the much smaller subset of this category of it's not Seven learning something, but Seven teaching someone else something. That sounds like a corollary to category number one. 
I do I do have a slight variant actually. I've got I've got a slight Janeway seven funny moment. Are there some? There's a seven tells a joke <laughs> moment, which is actually quite amusing. So this is this is also from Hope and Fear, which is an episode where we got a lot of Janeway seven stuff going on. But it it's quite interesting because Janeway sets off trying to teach Seven the lesson and, and she says I'm sorry that sometimes I'm hard on you, but I, I was never angry or regretful that I brought you on board. But because I'm your captain, it means I can't always be your friend. And she asks Seven if she understands, to which Seven replies, no. However, if we are assimilated, our thoughts will become one and I'm sure I will understand perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> and Janeway, Janeway just looks at her absolutely horrified and she says, a joke, Captain. You have encouraged me to use my sense of humour. <laughs> But was it really a joke? I don't know. I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> I can't. Th- I can't think of anything wittier that Seven comes out with at any point. I was quite amused by that one. A joke with a, a hint of truth behind it, though. There you go. That's a slight variant. It's still se- it's Still, Seven learns a lesson, but we don't get to see Seven trolling too often. You know, with her sarcasm. I no. mean, she is sarcastic, but she's just playing trolling and fishing there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice it's a nice end of series episode actually hope and fear for for the Janeway Seven relationship because it's I think they're trying to dip, put a bit of an emphasis on how far Seven's come in the well, it's probably not quite a year but the season since since the beginning of of the of the season there. So so are there more in your list? Do you have enough for one more round of this? Do you have another Seven learns a lesson moment? We haven't had any yelling moment. We haven't talked about many yelling moments actually, have we? We haven't talked about any proper all up in your face screaming moments. I actually, I actually picked, and it's funny that we've only just come to this one now because it's a really early one. From the gift, I actually picked out a scene that's very much, well, it's towards the end of the episode. It's one of the scenes where Janeway goes to see Seven in the brig and she's S- Seven's sort of having this crisis of the fact that she can't hear all the other voices of the Borg. Janeway's trying to get through to her and she sort of she tries to softly softly approach she's like oh do you remember this little girl shows her a picture of Annika do you remember what her favorite color was blah 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 seven sort of screams at her she's like irrelevant (laughs) (laughs) irrelevant irrelevant (laughs) yeah that's a conversation stop right there irrelevant yeah (laughs) well it is the ultimate way of shutting people down irrelevant (laughs) take me back to the Borg yeah, so she sort of tries to throw Janeway across the room there. But it, it ends in a, in a tender scene because they actually do have a hug at the end of this scene. So this is like a hybrid. Seven learns something and there's a hug. They're screaming and then there's hugging. Oh, wait, wait. So it's all three because we got, we got Seven learns something. We've got antagonism and we I'm have a hug. I'm not sure she learns anything at this point. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> she learned you can't get away with just saying irrelevant, irrelevant. Janeway's Janeway. trying to teach her something, but she doesn't actually learn anything. Aside from at the end, she just gets so kind of wound up in her head about wanting to go back to the board that she just kind of breaks down. She's like, put me back in. Yeah. I want to go back. Okay, well, this is a good question. So I, I know I don't, I don't like to mix Metatrex into the journey too much, but I'm going to just a little bit here. There was this philosopher, John Stuart Mill, who said it's better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Think about that for a minute, right? You know, you can have all your creature comforts and be content, but philosophers, they're discontent with the state of affairs, with the world, the things they don't understand. It's unsettling to be a philosopher. So is it better to be seven of nine dissatisfied than to be another member of a collective satisfied in the cube? So, so is it better to be separated from the Borg and be unhappy about it or to be happy in the collective because you don't know any better? Yes, that's exactly the question I'm asking. Oh, I'd always pick seven. I'd always say it's better to... Because it's a question of choice. It's about choice. And I think... I I can't place exactly the scene that this comes from, but I'm pretty sure Janeway has that conversation with her at one point where she's like, well, you say you want to go back, but the reason you say you want to go back is because you don't actually have the choice. You've not you, you've been so indoctrinated, effectively, that you, you don't have the choice to decide whether that's what you want. It's just because that's all you know. And and then I think Seven says something like, "Oh well, if I if I decide I want to go back once you deem that I'm completely separate, will you let me?" And that seems like the main lesson that that Seven has to learn from Captain Janeway that it's better to be a human with all of its struggles and flaws and imperfections than to be a perfect Borg in the cube. 
Yeah, because it is all just about having the choice because she never had the choice to be Borg in the first place. So kind of like being hooked up to the Matrix. Yeah. Although there are some people who have been, you know, unhooked from the Matrix that want to go back. They'd rather not know what they're missing. Like, is it better to be, you know, Barkley outside the holodeck dissatisfied or is it better to be Barkley content in his fantasies inside the holodeck? Barkley in the holodeck always. I think that's different because he's he's made the conscious choice to be in there. That's his choice to be to be there rather than in in his real life. So I'm I'm all about choice. Well, at first, that's the only way he could get Counselor Troy to talk to him, which you know, recreator in the holodeck. Wow. Well, Hollow Troy. <laughs> let's let's give her a correct title, the goddess of empathy. Thank you. <laughs> I can't say it without giggling, so I just couldn't. <laughs> yeah, but uh, seriously, I think Seven of Nine just has to learn that, I mean, human life is messy. It's got flaws and it's got, you know, choices that aren't easy and it's got struggles. And, you know, being a Borg is easy by comparison. Yeah. Exactly, which is why she wanted to go back. Why take the hard road when you have the easy path right in front of you? Yeah, totally. It's the path of yeah. least resistance. Yeah, and it's it's a difficult journey she has to go on to learn to separate what Seven wants with what the Borg have conditioned her to want. Mm-hmm. And and that's something that she really finds difficult because she, she thinks that she's all about perfection, but is she all about perfection? Is that really what Seven's all about or is that because that's what her Borg conditioning has has made her. It's interesting because in some ways you think, well, if if you want to go with a sort of nurture debate, yes, the, being with the Borg has made her that, and that and that and therefore that is that who she is. It's overridden the the nature side of things where she came from, but with that with long enough away from the Borg, could she learn to be something else? That's the question I think. Probably the last one that I that I want to really talk about is from someone to watch over me at the beginning. We get this lovely little scene where Janeway's getting dressed and she loses one of her pips on the floor and then she gets seven to help her put them on. That started so many fanfics. <laughs> I bet it did. I'm not surprised. It's like we never see anybody else putting the captain's pips on her. No. <laughs> you have to be good friends before you're helping someone get dressed, right? You know, casual. We've never seen Chakotay help her get dressed. And they're very good friends. There's a there's a really nice little dynamic to this scene. It's very casual. It's much more casual than we generally see Janeway in Seven of Nine scenes. And then Seven's helping her put the pips on in this whole sort of almost like girls getting dressed for the night out kind of way. <laughs> That's the rule. When the pips come off, you can be more casual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that the rule? She's not officially the captain until she's got all the pips on. Exactly. And then... <laughs> Janeway can, you know, sort of talks to Seven about the idea of trying out romance, which is which is what then leads to us getting the rest of that lovely episode that we all enjoy. So to go back to the thing I mentioned briefly at the beginning that I found really interesting that came out of doing this exercise. While there are a lot of Janeway and Seven moments, well over half of them are in season four. Yeah, there are. Season four is a real concentration of Janeway Seven moments. And actually, you know, as time goes on, we get less and less of them. I do love season four, but I do tend to think of it as the, as the you know, Seven of Nine gains her humanity season. Yeah. Yeah, and the fact that there were an awful lot of Seven Janeway moments in there didn't surprise me. But the fact that there were a lot less later on did surprise me. I thought that level of that interaction continued. But we actually get fewer and fewer of them as time goes on. And in season seven, there are far less. It would be interesting to kind of count them up and make a little bar graph or something. Here we go again. I'm a, and I'm always wanting to quantify things. Like, Venn diagram. Are you sure you don't want to make a Venn diagram about it? I don't actually have time to do this. But if one of you listeners out there has time to do this, go for it. Like make a bar graph with seven bars, one for each season, and make the bar as high as there are number of seven and Janeway moments in it. That's my challenge to you, to the journey listeners. See, I thought you'd want a Venn diagram of yelling moments, mm-hmm. emotional moments, and, and, and Seven Learns a Lesson moments. And okay, then we that's the extra fill credit. All in. If anyone wants to do that too, go for it. Yeah. Obviously, you'll have to index all of the moments in some exciting indexing system. So if any, if any to the Journey listeners want extra credit, that's how you can get it. We're all about statistics. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
probably the other thing really to talk about in summing up is I think Seven as a character, while there's complexity to the journey she goes on, I think as a character, she's very straightforward. How how she works and her motivations are quite obvious. The question that I have, and I'm still not sure about this, is the whole, as we said, why is it that Janeway fixates on this person that she's rescued from the collective. What What is the motivating factor behind that? And what is it about Janeway's character that means that she takes Seven on as a project in that way? That's the thing that I haven't really quite managed to fathom out. I come to this from the perspective of having been an educator. You know, when, when you, as an educator, look at your students, you see potential that is not actual yet, right? They have to work at it. And... And Captain Janeway, I think, sees potential and she wants to help her be the best version of herself. But she but she knows that she knows more about it than Seven does. And I think teachers know this about students, right? Teachers know that they know more about what's good for their students than the students do. And Captain Janeway knows better than Seven what's good for Seven. But just because she sees that potential in Seven doesn't mean Seven's going to live up to it. Yeah, like, like a lot of students don't, right? Yeah, I think this is an interesting yeah. one, though, because when when you talk about living up to the potential, it's... What Seven could become is, is, is not a definite thing. It's not like there is a specific goal she's trying to get to. She's just trying to get Seven to a point where she's able to make those sort of decisions for herself. You know, there's not an outcome, oh, well, I want her to look like this at the end of it, as Seven, Seven mistakenly thinks at one point. I think the, I think the potential that she sees is the potential for self determination and autonomy and and embracing the messy side of her humanity that that Captain Janeway sees some value and some beauty in and Seven doesn't see the value of any of that yet you know having come from the collective so she has and that doesn't mean she's gonna just because there's potential doesn't mean it will ever become real right potential's got to be worked at it's not it's not a guarantee that the goal will be met. I see in Janeway a really strong desire to like save everyone she just she's 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 Mm -hmm. like like we see in you know in in good shepherd and like we see with tom and like we see with any number of other people that you want to name down down the down the season she she just has this i have to fix them i have to sort this out that's just something that really strongly comes through with her for me unless they're the crew of the equinox well yeah or q but then q's (laughs) q's you know q really he's just a special case he doesn't need saving no, he's perfectly capable of looking after himself. What he does to the rest of the universe is by the by, but you know. <laughs> but Captain Janeway does try to have a good influence on Q's son. Yeah, and and that, again, that's the same. That's the same thing, isn't it? It's 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 let's save everybody. So it's like, it's like the cult of Captain Janeway. Let's save everybody. Yeah, Got it, it is. It is. I wonder. I I don't want to talk about books again too much, but you know, anybody who's read Mosaic. There's a, there's there's some stuff that goes on in that book that might suggest some of the reasons why she's ended up that way. You know, she's had some bad stuff go on in her past that you can you can see mm. why she'd get to the point where, you know, people that she's lost, that she's been unable to save and she's been the one to survive when they haven't. But again, she tried to save everybody in that situation. Yeah, she did. So you would have thought that she would have learned something from that, that you can't save everybody. You just can't. Yeah, I agree with you. It doesn't seem to stop her from trying. <laughs> but then equally speaking, there might be a sort of I can't lose anyone else kind of thing going on. Yeah. It's a strength and a weakness that she has, I think. It just depends on the situation and it depends how she acts on it and how it manifests itself. And that's what she did in Endgame. She had to save everybody. Yeah. Why she didn't go back, you know, one episode sooner and save Joe Carey is beyond me. <laughs> I never picked up on that. Yeah, there are a few people she doesn't seem too worried about saving, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I think if that's the way that we see Janeway and it certainly makes sense for for her character and her background, then definitely the the relationship that develops between her and Seven is something that that fits her character very well. And also Seven railing against everything and railing against her authority is something that fits (laughs) Seven's character very well. Well, I mean, learning is hard, right? I mean, personal growth, character development is hard. It's not like you can just sort of snap your fingers and be a fully autonomous, you know, human individual. Mm. Seven has to work at it. And people don't want to do that. It's like it's like a teacher, like like I'm thinking like a piano teacher forcing their students to to practice. Right? They don't want to do it. There's a thousand other things they'd rather do. But you have to force someone to put in the work. And and Captain Janeway is like that that gadfly that forces seven of nine to be the best version of herself yeah 
when she doesn't want to do it. Yeah, and she doesn't... It's not always perfect. I don't, I don't think she always challenges Seven in the right way or pushes Seven in the right way. Or not not always. I think, generally speaking, she's pushing her in the right direction. But she, she she makes mistakes just the same way that Seven does. But, I mean, that's the same with... if To go back to the parent-child analogy, you know, parents aren't perfect. <laughs> you know, they, the kids don't come with an instruction manual. You know, you've got to figure it out as you go along just as much as they do. What? They don't come with... No. No, I thought my little one was coming with a manual, you know, coming out and there's he's going to hand me the manual. I didn't sign up for this no manual <laughs> thing. I need to rethink this baby. <laughs> if anyone has any advice, I'll take it. I'll write you a manual, Suzanne. It'll be the parenting manual gleaned from Star Trek. So it'll be a little bit Janeway, you know, little bit, little bit of Samantha Wildman will be chucked in there. You know, we're going to have some Cisco. We're going to have some Rom. A little bit of Tuvok. Yeah. See, Suzanne, you could actually do a little studying of the doctor's oh, color program and what it's like to have a family. Yeah. If you want to study, you could ask. You know, we'll yeah. look at that and get a, and a get nice some and a nice big chunk of Beverly Crusher. No Kirk though, Kirk. Kirk oh no, no, no. Well, it wasn't his fault. He wasn't great at it, was it? <sighs> Except for you know all the Wesley sweaters. We can't have those. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's fine. They won't be fashionable until the twenty fourth century. That's fine. Or Worf. Worf was not particularly good <laughs> okay, with Alexander. Okay. I'd say Worf was worth, worse with Alexander than Kirk was with his son. But Loaxana Troy was true. really good with Alexander. Yes, she was. Not so good with her own daughter, but good with Alexander. I, I only have one response to that. <laughs> ha! <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been fun talking about Jane Wayne Seven this week, but it's not the only thing we've been talking about here on Trek FM. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek.fm, Standard Orbit. (coughs) Star Trek II had just premiered two weeks earlier, right? So everyone's all excited and flush. Oh my God, that's more like it. You know, they were all excited and flush about the Wrath of Khan being out. You know, it was the number one movie. It was incredible. People were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just imagine seeing the Wrath of Khan for the first time. Not knowing that it was always going to be the bar forever for every Star Trek movie after that. <laughs> Literary Treks. I'm glad we reread this because at the time I did read this, it was when the new movie was out. But now that we've had the three movies, as you just mentioned, and I've seen Star Trek 09 about a hundred times, I'm very familiar with the movie and not as much as with the comic now because I've only read it maybe a, few, a couple of times. Continuing mission. You know, we were pitching our idea, Don and I, to the folks at Starbase Studios. And I vowed to myself that I wasn't going to walk on the bridge and then go sit immediately in the chair and have a picture taken of myself. However, as soon as I got on the bridge, I sat in the chair and I took a picture of myself. Uh, (laughs) so, So it was like... A kid in a candy store. The 602 Club. I think the problem we have, and this is just in general of all the new canon books, these books are not going to succeed unless the author focuses on one or two characters and just focuses on building a character as much as they can. I felt this was more just like you were saying, this is just more story of what's going on and not really about who these people are and why I should care about them. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out these shows and find out what we're talking about in your favourite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button. That helps us out greatly and makes it easier for other listeners to find the show as they search iTunes. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud and now also on Google Play and YouTube. And of course, you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website and grab the RSS link as well. Another way you can help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week is to become a patron of the network through Patreon. If you visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm, you'll find our current goals and different milestone contribution levels, along with all the great perks we have for you. These perks include early access to content, exclusive content, producer credits, seats in our content development team, and many more. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We have a few people we would like to thank. Firstly, the founder and publisher of Trek FM, C. Brian Jones. 
Our executive producers, Matthew Rushing and Kenneth Tripp. Aaron Harvey, our art director. Richard Marquez, our production manager. And Brandon Shea-Matella, our Patreon manager. Let's not forget our associate producers. Big round to Bruce Lish, Ju Kim, and Norman Lau. And don't forget to check out Enterprise in Space, a project of the nonprofit National Space Society. Visit enterpriseinspace.org to find out more and to get your seat on the mission. And check out audible.com, offering more than 150,000 titles for your desktop or mobile device. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. If you'd like to contact us about this episode or any episode of To The Journey, head over to trek.fm slash contact. While you're there, you can also leave us a voicemail. Look in the sidebar on our To The Journey show page or go to speakpipe.com slash trekfm. You can also find us on Twitter. Our handle is at trekfm. Or if you're on Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash trekfm. While you're on Facebook, check out the Babel Conference, Trek FM's listeners-only discussion group. You can also find it on our website at trek.fm if you just click the discussion button on the menu bar. We also invite you to leave a rating and review of To The Journey on iTunes. We'd love to hear your feedback and suggestions for the show. So, Kay, when you're not attaching the captain's pips to her uniform, where can people find you? Well, you can find me in the Babel Conference. And if you want to look me up on Twitter, my handle is Choco Weeble. Zach, when you're not draping yourself across your alcove for the doctor to paint you, where can people find you? Well, you can find me elsewhere on Trek FM as co-host of Metatrex, Trek FM show on Star Trek and philosophy, along with my co-host there, Mike Morrison. You can always find me in the Babel Conference if you want to talk about Star Trek with me there. And you can find me on Twitter. My handle is just my name, at Zachary Fruling. That's Zachary, Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y, Fruling, F-R-U-H-L-I-N-G. And Suzanne, when you're not replicating a bowl of strawberries, Annika Hansen style, where can our listeners find you on the Trek FM network and around the interwebs? I'll occasionally pop up in the Babel Conference. You can also find me on Twitter at KJaneway8. That's the letter K, Janeway, and the number eight. So join us next week when we'll be having a velocity tournament. But until then, this has been To The Journey. (laughs) 